international trade, your business moves as expected. In logistics planning, you need time. Any time that you don't have time at your disposal, it is cost. So we have outlined the governance structure, the structure of imports, the caliber of agents, IT infrastructure, and capacity building. We looked at GCNet and West Blue Consulting. Structure of imports, we identified that if we have a situation where we have, we have not clearly defined how boxes, uh, containers can be loaded and how they are even, in the case of consolidation, discharged, it creates its own problem. If you commingle just about everything into one, then you need a lot of examination time and that creates the uh, problem for delivery. We looked at the caliber of agents. We, we said, we, we did an introspection. We said that, true, our area was one place where you could just walk in and begin to work. But that also doesn't mean that we didn't have entities amongst us that could meet any world-class standard. We still do have the two situations running. But unfortunately, if you're not lucky, you might get into contact with those we all call the charlatans. And normally it happens so when you are a little bit gullible too, because clearly they will present to you cheaper rates. So we identified all these things. Now, we looked at the shipping lines too. We said, <clears throat> in all of this, the shipping lines were required to present manifest in a certain way. You see, what we're trying to demonstrate is that so far a lot of the issues that came with IT solution is no longer an issue. So if we need any push, if we need any further pluses, it is about focusing attention on the governance structure because the governance structure delivers a whole lot of things. It delivers certainty, it delivers protocols, it delivers accuracy, it delivers less time. It delivers the situation where you know where you belong. So we had the process kick-started in 1st September, and we had the flow mapped. When the flow was mapped, we didn't have national security within the port. This is why we need that governor structure. Then you get into the port and the national security, you know national security. These are folks you don't joke with because they come with a huge aura. Now you have a national security operative come to flash his ID card in your face that stop this cargo. Whereas the system perfectly had cleared you. What do you do? You stop the cargo because he wasn't part of the flow. He was not on the network. So the next thing you ask of you is your declaration. Mind you, it was supposed to be paperless. So you have to get back to your office, print the paper, and come and give it to him. Whatever he does with the paper, I will, I will let you into that one pretty soon. You see, but then, trust you me, that singular act of intervention can make you stay within the port for another three days. So the absence of an effective governance structure, that is what is missing in the mix now. So if anybody wants to help the system, this is where the focus must be. Now the shipping lines are being required to pour in manifest in a certain manner. For all these years, it has been difficult. I must tell you, the only shipping line that can meet that requirement today is MEST line. But because the others have not met it, that system cannot be activated. This one is not an IT problem. We needed a directive that will issue as a result of a governance structure to demand that everyone who must do this business or every, everyone who operates within the port must have a set of standards to meet. But trust you me, even though we don't have the optimum expectation of the governance structure, the political will of the vice president and his 
keen interest in succeeding in what he has started has forced the hands of some of these interlocutors to comply. That is not what we want. We want the structure to be established. I will show you pretty soon why we want the structure to be established too. Of course, we mentioned the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders, and we also intone that our friends from the Customs Brokers Association of Ghana, we are all migrating seriously onto IT platform. Of course, GIF, we are almost 90% into that delivery because we want to complement the efforts at networking, at paperlessness, at injecting IT solutions into our work. So it makes it easier for all of us to roll. I is the sweetness of what we are doing. We want to we want to have this intercourse at that level. That is why we brought this meeting here. If you see Ghana amongst Africa, we are leading. We the certificates that we have issued for theater diploma by country, we are around 488. That's our performer. We just wanted you to know that the port is not filled with reef rafts. Now, when we came to the challenges with the paperless port, we are following the conversation just like that. We touch on governance structure. Then we split, we split governance structure into two, conflicting legal mandates. Now, all the folks who have their presence within the port are there legally. They have statutes backing them. And GRA is supposed to be the, uh, the controller. But then, that's where it ends. You should remember that we practice democracy. So you are in the pot with your laws as GRA. Food and drugs are also in the pot with their laws. So is standard authority. So is veterinary. So is uh, PPRSD, Atomic, all of them. They have enactments that require them to exercise their mandate in a certain way within the pot. So they all flash their laws in your face. And then we have the conflict. For this reason, we needed a governance structure. A governance, after all, who gave them the mandate? It is the state. So the state can breach the gaps. If they, that's, also, that's what we call the legal gap. The state can bridge it. If your law conflicts this, for which reason trade or the facilitation of which is being impaired, the state can look at this and take out these gaps. Then we had an issue as a challenge of ownership, which has been cured by the amendment of 891 by 923, as we have uh, uh, earlier on spoken about. Because ownership must be defined in such terms that you know who owns that ecosystem. Then we have override. I've mentioned semblance of overrides already. We had customs themselves overriding their own processes with their preventive officers. And then we have national security, the police, the BNI, the Gapoha security, everybody. Recently, we had even one, the eye of the president. They all can just override the process. But we are very clear in our minds that once we have the governance structure in place, we'll be there. Pretty soon I'll explain the governance structure. So we are identifying block by block the areas of trouble, those who pose challenge. 3.1.4, the Customs Technical Service Bureau. That is where we go for the customs classification and valuation report. I just want to mirror a conversation that ensued. You see, when we talk of governance structure, the absence of it is the absence of protocols. The absence of protocols deliver a certain atmosphere. One, it delivers the, the, the atmosphere of discretion. And customs are those, with, are those heavily with discretionary powers. That in itself is not bad, but every discretion must be exercised responsibly. That's why we are asking for protocols. And protocols can be established only if we have a decisive governance structure in place. 
Now, this is a conversation that happened. At the CTSB, a declarant put in an application. And then a customs officer responded as such. You do not have good eyesight. You cannot read. So let me just read this one. GRA says, kindly attach Indian customs shipping bill document. Please focus on this one pretty. And this process started on the 9th of April 2018 at 1.53 p.m. 13.53.15. That's the time tag on this process. Now watch something. Then the customs officer came and said, can you attach the Indian Customs Shipping Bill document? Then the declarant responded, Shipment in question is an air courier shipment, hence has no shipping bill. Thanks. Then the customs officer responded, Since there is no shipping bill document, attach Indian Customs export document. Then the, de the declarant responded, Like I mentioned earlier, this is courier shipment. The Indians are under no obligation to give us their export declaration. I submit, therefore, that you do not make it a mandatory requirement. This is expedited mail, so please fall on any other acceptable method, if need be. Thank you. The custom officer was not satisfied, so he came back. Since there is no shipping bill document, attach Indian customs export document. Please. You know he has made this demand already. Please call Customs Help Desk. Then he gave the number. Then the declarant responded, with all due respect, officer, you are demanding a document I can clearly not provide. This should not result in a stalemate. Your referral of me to call, call center beggars the issue at stake. If situations can be escalated to a superior for redress, let's pursue that option instead. Thanks. Then he comes back finally and says, we still insist you call Customs Help Desk. Now, this conversation from 09 04 2018 up to 19.56, that is 7 p.m. 10.04, 24 hours. I want somebody to tell me this is the fault of an IT platform. 24 hours. We kept going up and down. So if we talk of governance structure, which will relate to protocols, if protocols were established, this customs officer will not use discretion to ask these questions. He just wasted everybody's time. And trust you me, when we put the heat on, the document was released in 30 minutes. So it tells you that the export declaration he was asking for, that's why I, 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 I stated earlier, the WTO, the Trade Facilitation Agreement, it frowns on these demands. And this is a customs officer asking for this. He should know better. I think the Trade Ministry has an onerous task because this trade facilitation conversation is not percolating. It is just hanging up there. This is what is happening. This wasted our 24 good hours. Then we have the call, the, the customs call center. The call center is now like an OPD, an outpatient department. You have to trek to that unit and then the meet to meet thing that we don't want. We get it established again. So if help must come, this is the area that help must come to. The compliance seat. The compliance seat, they have their argument, but we think their argument is not on because these ones are a bit technical. You, are, you might not, sorry, I mean, not to, uh, how do you call it, question your understanding of these processes, but I'm sure you, 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 are, you know what I mean. The compliance seat, day after you have gotten your CCVR, the CCVR is issued by customs officers. After you've gotten your CCVR, you do your declaration and there's another set of customs officers who will now watch to see whether your figures are right. I mean, this 
can be taken care of by technology. And technology is indeed taking care of these things. So that seed which is outside of the CCVR or that has been grafted is a no-no. We are asking that it be placed at the point where the CCVR is issued. Then we, we realize something about effective use of data for risk management. I'm going to show you a graph. Hopefully this one you can see. Now this is September 2017 when we started the paperless at the Thema port. Now the idea was to move non-intrusive examination to close to 40, 45 percent so that we get red reduced. Now, but it's an interesting story that you, 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 if you are watching the slide, you realize September 2017, the green be began coming down rather, and the red shot up, shot up to 76, January 2018. When we got this statistics, we started asking questions. You know, in September, when we started the paperless spot, certain containers were released green. And proper officers, that's custom officers, that, that's their other name. Proper officers intercepted these containers by intelligence. Intelligence based on risk management. When they intercepted the, the, the containers, it turned out that those containers had elements in it which were not supposed to be released green. And by the exploits of our media, it was front page. Hey, the system is bad. It allows something out and it's been arrested. Then we sat back and said, ah, but what was the risk engine supposed to do? What was intelligence supposed to do? Intelligence was supposed to do exactly what had happened. But because of the frenzy, every other thing was tightened. And that's what we have. So instead of green going up, it started coming down. Red was going up, up, up. But look at what happened when red went up. Red means physical examination. Dito, dito. That is not trade facilitation because this is country is import dependent. If we are going to have 76% of our stuffs physically examined, then we, should, we shouldn't have signed a trade facilitation agreement. Now, if you look at this slide, for 17, uh, 2017, September, for contraband goods, we have zero. Red, when the goods were physically examined, this is the report. All this report, we quoted the source as a, from the Joint Inspection Performance Statistics from 2017 to February 2018. If you look at excess quantity, seven. Prohibited or restricted goods, zero. Non-declared goods, zero. Short-landed, one. Misclassification, zero. Now, the lawyers will call something the, these are the egregious package. from contraband to under invoicing. These are the elements that the state frowns upon heavily because they border directly on revenue, they border directly on health, they border directly on security. But you check, just do a random check. Now look at the last element, others. others you know, customs, anything that doesn't go through their system, by their definition, they call it customs offense. Now, others, look at others. For September 90, you run it through. For October 406, the sum total, 2,273 others. These others constitute things like typing a name wrong, a container number has zero in the string of characters. You mistakenly put O, the system will reject it. Customs 
will note it or the system will note it as customs offense. Now, having done this, shouldn't somebody be doing some analysis of this to help better the system? But this is the true story. Your container must be moved to Golden Jubilee. It has been left at MPS. That is no fault of you, the trader, the importer, or your agent. But you have to effect post-entry. That exercise of effecting post-entry will be captured as a customs offense. And these are the things that shoot up the numbers or the figures in others. Our humble opinion is that if we had an established governance structure properly monitoring this situation, it will be reported back into the system so that those who are compliant will be allowed to use the green channel and wouldn't have this huge red showing up all over. So, ladies and gentlemen, when we do this, we do it with our eyes on the ball. We are number one people who will want a free space to do our business because the ease with which we do business it has a direct correlation with how much money we make as profit with our proposed solutions ladies and gentlemen because we are very clear in our minds what the problem is in the port we rest it on the governance structure. God being so good, the World Trade Organization, of which we are members, has a model. A model governance structure. It is here. No, you can, you can stay at the top. Because they have done this in different countries. They know the problems that are likely to be seen. So if you can go to the table, uh, yeah, yeah, this place. This is how the structure looks like. This is for WTO. We have suggested, in fact, we have localized one. The top level policy steering group, look at the participants. Prime Minister slash President, all ministers and the advisors. They constitute the steering group. It is headed by either the Prime Minister the president. So that tells you the seriousness of the governance structure and the seriousness of the absence of the governance structure. Because if we should have a group headed by any of this, we should have it for an optimum delivery of a system that we are trying to uh, uh, have implemented and we have it. Then you can understand why we have the difficulty we have. Then you can pat on the shoulders people who have held the foot up to this point. It comes down to the high level management. We want to ignore it and show you the structure that we have proposed. So this is the structure we have proposed. The vice president chairing the steering committee. We are just using the WTO model. And then we have the National Trade Facilitation Committee, which interfaces between our country and the World Trade Organization. And then we have the Single Window Technical Committee, we have the Implementation Working Group, and then we have the Risk Management Committee. You see, because the things that are happening downstream, when you conduct examination, what happens? Somebody can say that, oh, those statistics are not correct. The, the government of that took the money and he and the agent split it. But we don't, you and I don't have the facts to justify that kind of claim. What we have on paper is what we are using. That is a scientific basis of our conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, we didn't end up there. We have explained what the structure must do. We have gone to explain what importers or import configuration must be. We have touched on freight forwarders associations. We have touched on the things that must be done to make sure that we are all delivering at our optimum. We have touched on compliance seat and where it must be relocated. We have touched on the call center. In fact, we have asked that 
a deputy commissioner heads the call center because the call center should not be treated as a low level uh, uh, unit. We want it to have that high level situation. Ladies and gentlemen, to cut the chase, in every system, why we don't need Unipass? In every system implementation, in every system implementation, a basic assessment has to be done to establish a gap, if any. Once this is done, a proof of value, POV, must be done to establish the strategic fit. This process is to ensure that the system being implemented aligns with the strategic objectives of the entity implementing the system. In high-end system implementation, like in the case of the port, various forms of simulations, pre-tests, and parallel runs must be done to ascertain the efficacy of the system. Aside this, various players and stakeholders in the industry must be extensively consulted to give their input and acceptance. In the wake of the rigorous review of the paperless sport system, spearheaded by no mean a person but the vice president of the land, we suddenly hear of the Unipass system announced by the Ministry of Trade to replace the existing workable solutions on the ground. The trajectory on which we are riding is not only chaotic but suicidal. We have traveled on this journey before and have learned our lessons as a country. And for that matter, we don't need to repeat the errors of old. This is why it was very unfortunate for the Ministry of Trade to have announced the replacement of GCNet and West Blue system with no justification. While the ministry takes this initiative, they fail to understand that the port as a strategic asset of this country cannot and must not be used for experiment. Since 2002, when GCNet introduced the national single window, there has been some consistent incremental progress in the areas of trade facilitation, revenue mobilization, business process, and IT infrastructure. One seems to wonder why, with all these successes amid the resolvable challenges, a decision will be reached without evidential fact to replace these systems. Perhaps we need to ask the following questions. Have we assessed critically the impact of this intervention on trade facilitation and revenue mobilization? If yes, what are the targeted key performance indicators, KPIs, I mean? To what extent have we engaged the stakeholders who will integrate with the Unipass system? And what will be the cost and the time of integration and who bears the cost? Have we considered the impact of the change in terms of cost training, change management and integration and time? What is the total cost of the Unipass projects? What is the nature of the Unipass contract? Are we scrapping GCNet and West Blue systems? Who bears the consequential cost of scrapping the two systems or two existing systems? Have we thought of judgment debts? What happens to the 35% shareholding of government in GCNet? Furthermore, it has been established that the, pro the processing fee for the Unipass system will be 0.75 free on board, that is FOB, compared to the combined fee of GCNet 0.40 of FOB and West Blue 0.28 of CIF, which sums up to 0.68 in simplistic terms. We say in simplistic terms because we know we are missing CIF and FOB interchangeably, but I don't think we we'll have a problem with that kind of analysis because there's a precedent. It is important to re-emphasize that the government, referred to table three above, receives 35% out of the point out of the 0.40% fee of GCNet. So in real time, GCNet receives 0.26, that is 0.40 less 35, 35%. This brings down the total of 0.68 to 0.54. That is the 0.26 plus 0.28 of West Blue. These are the bare facts and as such, government will have to choose between Unipass fee of 0.75 and the existing fee of 0.54. It is important for the Ministry of Trade to understand that the strategic role of the port and its impact on GDP and the economy at large, and for which reason they have to go back to the drawing board and rethink care intervention.
it should be noted that any such intervention should be driven strategically by evidential data suggesting a justifiable reason for the takeover. Interestingly, in this write-up, we have been able to prove beyond all reasonable doubt by facts and figures that what we have on the ground is a work in progress and challenges identified are being fixed and therefore any attempt to replace the system will be akin to reinventing the wheel. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't need Unipass. Thank you very much. My name is Dennis Amfusipa. I'm a member of the Ghana Institute of Free Forward. I'm saddened because our president did not touch on it. And breaking down the 1% the that we pay on the CCBR is not what the income or which amount goes to government. The cost of doing business in our port is high. And we believe that Unipass charging 1.4, which is higher than what uh, Unipass is going to charge, 0.7% of CI. You are misleading the public of the Ghana Institute of Free Forwarders. You are my president, but this is not a fact. No, can you repeat what you are important. Used by the, the supposed introduction of Unipass to 0.75 which is far cheaper than what they are currently paying. But by coming here to give us a breakdown of how that 1% is distributed would not affect the importer or the ordinary Ghanaian. But if we are able to introduce in the past, as government wants to, which is going to reduce the cost of doing business, why are we opposed? I, I don't really understand it. And the job that is being done by West Blue and GCNet is going to be done by one agency, which means that we have one platform on which we will process all our documents. Currently, we process our documents on more than three platforms. You process one on the pass, you come back to the CCVR platform, after that you go to GCNet to process another document. So if we are having Unipass, which is giving us one platform, on which we are going to process all the documents at a far cheaper rate, I don't see why freight forwarders should be fighting government this one. So why are we fighting government and explaining where the 1% goes? Because the importer pays 1%. He doesn't care who gets what and who doesn't get what. We have produced a document. Take the document and tear it into pieces. That's what we are here for. I really cannot make a head or tail from the intervention that my good friend just made. Seriously, because at the point he was saying, I have said uh, West Blue and you are misleading. I'm misleading the public by 1.4 percent. Hi, didn't I never mentioned any 1.4? If you have heard any 1.4 being mentioned, it is not coming from me. Probably you should go get the tips. TV3 is here. Who mentioned 1.4? Please, and we shouldn't be emotive about these things. That's why we have laid bare facts and figures. We've quoted sources. If you want to come again, do it on the basis of facts and figures, not emotions. Thank you. Stephen, of course, your press conference um, was rescheduled last week. And so when I got the information that you have a press conference, I decided to look into the issues and then so that we can have a better engagement. That's right. I have a couple of questions to ask. First one is, whose interests are you pursuing? Um, GCNet, West Blue, Government of Ghana, or Ministry of Trade and Industry? That's my first issue. And then again, you also remember, of course, on the basis of the information that I have, if it's wrong, you just dismiss that one as well. Um, in 2015, June and December, there was a study and according to the information I have, the study was actually conducted, um, was conducted by Nick Danso's company in partnership with Unipass. And among the recommendations they made was that, um, let me just quote so that there won't be any form of confusion. Among the recommendations they made was, was okay. So can I read? You say Ghana Link Service, yeah, the Ghana Link Services Limited and a technical partner, Unipass, in 2015 mm -hmm. did a study 
between June and December on the current state of affairs of Ghana's trade challenges and recommended appropriate solutions and systems for enhanced trade facilitation and revenue generation. What they said, what, one of the recommendations was that Ghana should implement electronic sub submission system of manifest for utilization of cargo information and implement cargo processing status tracking based on cargo reference number. Probably you may have to comment on that one as well. And then you also remember the Ministry of Trade, of course, because they are the agency that had to sign all this agreement, um, wrote a letter to PPA or Public Procurement Authority. And they came out, the reason for probably writing that letter, or among the reasons which led to PPA agreeing with the ministry to have an agreement with Unipass, where that one say, in the view of the ministry, Unipass system is far better in offering trade facilitation compared to what West Blue and um, GC Net are offering. Beyond all this information, I just want to ask a layman's question, do. Um, the narrative that you give, I certainly that I ask myself, is it to tell the people of Ghana, or tell the, yeah, tell the people of Ghana that government was wrong in signing that 10-year contract with Unipass? And again, in your view, do you think Unipass have the capacity to implement what they are telling us? And are you, are you against the 0 0.75 rate they are charging for which reason you are telling the people of Ghana that um, Unipass is not the best, and for that matter, we should deal with GCNet and then um, West Blue. Probably when I have to come back, I may, if you, if you oblige me, do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then when, we take off, when we take off like this, it will be useful. One, in whose interest? I'll have to let you know my bias this morning. I hope we are still in the morning. One, my name is Kabna Ofusuapia. I am a Ghanaian and for that matter a citizen of Ghana. I have been charged to be a citizen. That's one. Two, I belong to the Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders. This is our constitution. The object of our constitution Article 3. If you look at G, I'm going to read it all out for your benefit. It says, to facilitate the exchange and dissemination of information and views on carriage of goods, customs clearance, warehousing, cargo handling, consolidation and containerization procedures, and practice with the aim of forging sound public opinion on these objects or subjects. Two, that is J. It says, to take all lawful steps and where necessary, in collaboration with like-minded organizations to protect the national interest, especially when it relates to the business and profession of freight forwarders. I hope that answers your question of whose interest. Two, a study by Ghana Lane, isn't it a bit interesting? You know who is behind the Unipass? That should be a good dose of an answer to that question. Then you talk about 0.75. You see, somewhere last week or a week and a half or two weeks ago, that the deputy trade minister, he's here. If if I'm if I'm going to misquote him, he has the opportunity to correct himself. Or uh, to correct me, sorry. He was on TV3, and that's why I was a bit confused why uh, Dennis, who is our member, was rather attributing that quotation to me. He was on TV3, if TV3 is here, and stated that GCNet and Ghana Link, sorry, and West Blue charge 1.4 on CIF, and that Unipass is going to charge 0.75 on FOB. I'm sure, given reasons why Unipass should be the preferred candidate. And we are just here to tell you that that statement cannot be wholly factual. And we have demonstrated that. 
if you are not clear on that slide, the slide is here, the document is here. We can just refer you to it. We have demonstrated to you the percentage that GCNet takes, the percentage that West Blue takes. If you are here on the basis of haziness, I will not do hazy thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gone into details like this. We are here to do an exercise to tell it as it is. And that's how come they say that the details, the devil is in the details. We want everybody to see what the details are. And that's what we have brought forth. Now, Ghana is a member of the trade, uh, World Trade Organization. The, the World Trade Organization has certain articles under it that member countries must take steps to achieve. Now, one of these articles is on discipline on fees and charges. If you are engaged in customs processes, I, I will, I'll tell you why that wisdom. If you are engaged in customs processes, the articles on fees and charges says that, fine, some of our fees and charges is actually a revenue base for government. But if you become a member of the trade, the World Trade Organization, take steps to normalize how you charge. It should no longer be ad valorem. Meaning that if you bring a shipload of rice, maybe uh, 40, 40, uh, maybe four, four million dollars, if you bring anything, four million dollars, why should an entity take one percent or whatever percent of the invoice value, whereas he's just going to work on one line item and take a percentage. So the WTO and in the Trade Facilitations Agreement is encouraging all member countries to do well. If you are charging it already, do well within a certain time frame to revert to specific charge so that if you are bringing a bag load and it is one CD, you pay a specific fee because the idea is that the service that you are going to render, you are not going to carry all these loads on your head before you can render those services for which you charge by percentage. So we are saying the Ministry of Trade, they are the ones holding the trade facilitation agreement. In the knowledge of this, why would they with their eyes wide open enter into another agreement whose fees charging is based on ad valorem. When we have signed a document which says that even for those that are charging on ad valorem basis, take steps, I think within three years of notification, to correct that situation. You see, so folks, if this argument or if this conversation must be had, it must be had on the basis of fact. That is why we have produced this. If you do not have the facts properly situated, we can give you a copy. We have it on WhatsApp. We send you a copy. Take time. Look at it. For all you know, it must get us a better deal. We are not here fighting government in quotes, like he put it. Of course, we, did we look like we were fighting government? No. Otherwise, you would have seen red bands on our head. We have not given any ultimatum. We are engaging. We want a rich discourse so that Ghana will be better served. We intervene like that in CTN. It has done the round. It has come back. If for nothing at all, probably certain things have been taken out. We are going to look at it. We intervene like this in fumigation. It was scrapped. <coughs> Will you call this fighting government? If government didn't see sense in our superior arguments, you think we would have been listened to? No, so please, let's move away from this cocooned perception of ourselves. We have what it takes to, to interrogate the matters and interrogate it well. Thank you. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my president and uh, the president, able leadership. <laughs> no, my president, as far as Ghana is afraid for what is concerned. 
and um, of course the leadership of uh, the Ghanaians of Great Forwarders. Um, friends of the press, ladies and gentlemen, it is always interesting to see my um, gift president speak. And I admire him so much when he comes out with all those um, um, intriguing performance, especially when it has to do with, um, you know, parading what he thinks is the interest of the Institute, which is, of course, what is vested in him to do, except for sometimes his choice of words, which I uh, strongly uh, think that um, uh, do not. If you look at the literal meaning of some of the words, I a bit, um, a bit too strong. I, I admire him so much, and I am not disappointed one bit to have him as, as my president. I, I say, shoulder on, Mr. President, um, you're doing a very good job. Now, um, I am here, first and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, not in the stead of the Ministry of Trade, but I'm here as a bona fide or bona fide member, a paid up member, strong member of the Ghana of Free Forwarders. So if my association is having, uh, what do you call, uh, a press conference, I have a right to be here. Uh, coincidentally, parts of the information that was uh, churned out today has to do with uh, an institution that I represent in the name of the government. Uh, and by so saying, um, I am the one that's supposed to speak for government on that particular issue. So it's not too, um, you know, um, bad that you find me here this morning to probably articulate some of the uh, viewpoints of government with the questions that have been raised here today. But before I commence, I'd like to borrow my president, who is, uh, but this time my president, I please advisedly, as the gift president, uh, his um, initial comment, which borders on if um, you tax somebody to dig a tunnel from here to Makola, or is it Makola? Yes, Makola. 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 You can um, ask two or three other people to join in this uh, contract and help in the digging of this tunnel. That is very true. Uh, that is very correct. But it is also correct that you can decide to change the contractor at any time and get a new contractor to dig this tunnel and push or shoulder on or push forward. Uh, by so saying, I want to advance the argument that it is not wrong for government to change policy directions at any particular time when they feel that certain things are not working well. Um, we as a government, we've been in power for about one year, four months. There's so much that we have seen, so much that we have come, that, that has come across our desk as to what is disturbing our revenue maximization or trade facilitation processes. So it is only imperative that we set think through and decide the way forward. Um, for quite some time, customs targets or revenue targets are not being met. And as a privileged member of the Board of Ghana Revenue Authority, there's so many interventions that we are bringing up which I don't have the authority or the mandate of my board chairman to spill out here, to, as it were, augment the collection of revenue uh, so as to um, assist Ghana or assist the government of Ghana in developing our nation. So I would have been of the opinion that if government is bringing a policy, which, of course, is a policy that is going to help in the development of this nation. The people of this country, who uh, of course must be citizens, who have any questions, first thing you do is to approach the ministry in charge and verify if you have any questions. I am very surprised that in the presentation that we just saw, um, it's a very brilliant presentation. And I, I must say that I associate myself with this presentation, the most part, and of course the president will also um, bear me out 
that most of the things that they have shown here are my concerns that we have you know put to the fore before indeed if you care to know and it's no secret that i am the orchestrator of the paperless process i was the one that the vice president gave the opportunity to come up with the flow process or the direction that we're supposed to take unfortunately the rollout was given to another delivery unit so you don't see me much in the fore or in the forefront when it comes to speaking to it but my president which is a gift president was one of my committee members were four or five of us and he was one of them so most of the things they put here are very relevant to the um, sources of the paperless processes but if you look at the whole presentation Everything to do with the presentation is at the last bit, which he took his time to read out very well. And, and, and for me, I would have thought that in reading all those things and coming out with about nine questions there, the question I want to ask my president of GIF is, did you approach the Ministry of Trade to find out answers to these questions? I sit in the ministry as a deputy minister I sit in a ministry as uh, somebody with so much experience in logistics service provision. And I sit in the ministry as the one that speaks for government when it comes to anything to do with trade net or trade platforms. So if you have any challenge, the easiest place to enter is my office. Because, of course, you and I were even sleeping there when we were doing these paperless uh, meetings. So it is not a new place to you. Why wouldn't anybody? make that initial effort of trying to find out whether there is questions that are supposed to be answered or answers that are supposed to be given to questions before you come out with your position. I have been in this position before. Between 2009 and 2013, I was the president of Ghana Institute of Freight Forwarders. There's so many things that came to the fore that I needed answers to and I stood against. But at the end, we have to uh, uh, agree on one principle. In this case, I have not been contacted. My minister has not been contacted, but GIF has come up with a position. For me, I think it's a bit wrong. If you have questions, you come in, you ask us, and we'll speak to them. We have not even come out officially with Unipass. It just so happens that people of the press who are always you know, looking for things, digging, or being men with them, looking for things, Happened to go to PPA, and you found this thing there on their website. So you started coming out with stories. The official launch of Unipass has not been done. I don't know if there's any press person here who can say that he has attended an official launch of Unipass. It's certainly going to come on, but it has not been done yet. If people have found out that it is captured on the uh, website of PPA and they want to talk about it, that is okay. You can't stop anybody from speaking. But let us ask the relevant questions before we come up with positions and so on and so forth. Now, I think about last week somewhere, Obi Menu's uh, editorial uh, captured me uh, as uh, not getting over my hangover. It's a, it's a, it was a very interesting piece. And I always admire his, his uh, writings about me. Uh, which is not, um, uh, you know, uh, it's not too bad. I mean, it's, it's okay for, 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 for publicity. But the point is, the self-publication, of course, what happened, let me even put up the publication away. But what has been said here today is that I have mentioned on TV3 that GCNet takes 1%. And um, West Blue takes 0.4%. Mm -hmm. Whether CIF or FOB, like the president of GIF said previously, in simpli simplistic terms, you don't want to go into the calculations, otherwise you, you'll be confused. But somehow, 1% and 0.4% of something is being charged by these two bodies. As to who takes what at the backside, for you and I, it doesn't matter. The most important thing is what the importer pays at the front end of the importation of these products. 
And here, let me also remind us, our interest is not in GCNet or West Bank. Our interest is in the Ghanaian importer. We are doing everything possible. And if you look at my, uh, my paperless report, it was geared towards reducing the cost of doing business in the port. Indeed, in my master's thesis, I wrote on uh, reducing the cost of doing business in the port, contribution by the clearance processes. And that is my expertise. So everything that we are doing now is geared towards how we can reduce the cost of doing business to the importers of Ghana. It's not about West Blue. It's not about GCNet. We don't have anything against GCNet. We don't have anything against West Blue. But we have everything against not maximizing revenue collection or implementing appropriate trade facilitation uh, methodologies. And that's exactly what we are doing. Now, if we display paperwork showing that um, the 1% that is collected, uh, point this goes to that, point that goes to that, point that goes to that. Until today, how many people in this room knew that? Until today. How many importers in Ghana knew this? All the Makola importer or the Coca-Cola importer knows is that. When he comes, bring goods into the country, he has to pay 1% inspection fee to GCNet. And it's finished. So therefore, if that 1% that he's paying is going to reduce to 0.75%, it is time even on FOB and not CIF. Why would he not say that he has saved some money? Let me give you a simple uh, calculation. Gassem brings Klinka into this country, let's say one, one vessel or two vessels every month. Iranian brothers bring wheat into this country, let's say one vessel, two vessels every month. And they bring large quantities, 25,000 metric tons. You are talking product which has a world market value about $500 per ton, $600 per ton. If he's bringing this product which is $30 million at a time, 1% of that alone is about $3 million, if my calculation is right. 1% alone should be $3 million, even if it's $300,000. Hmm? If he is getting 60% of $300,000, can't he build in his CSR, in his, in his, in his uh, um, 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 corporate social responsibility, can't this money be, be pushed there to do some things for, for our country? So why would anybody frown upon the fact that what the importer is paying, like Irani Brothers or, or, or Gassan, He's going to save more than half of what he's been paying here too. And we'll have problem with the payment. That is all I was trying to explain. I didn't want to go on TV and explain all these percentage breakdowns. For your information, the 1% that you have shown there, if you take out the point, uh, uh, they said uh, GCNA gets what, 0.35? I forgot. 0.4. GCNA gets 0.4. Okay, that is intact for GCNA. They didn't break that down. But if you look we at did. West Bruce, we did. We did. you did? Yes. Okay. Now, if you look at, let's say you did, 0.4%, but that is, that is being paid by the customer. If you look at West Blue's uh, 1%, for example, which is on CIF, uh, I understand West Blue, the only one that is stepping out, takes uh, 0.35, as they, as they showed on the thing, but um, it can um, transmogrify to uh, 0.28. Okay. If they take 0.35 out of 1%, you're left with 0.75. Not so. All the people who take 0.75, the most important is Ghana Link for scanning. He is there in Unipass. Scanning will still continue in the 0.75. So it means that the 0.35 is in, 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 in calculated uh, amongst that 1%. Take it out of 0.75, you get 0.4. 1% issuing unit, also for Ghana Link. If you take it out, you are left with 0.3. If you share all those ones, and I, I'm only doing this calculation just to tell you that it is very, a bit unfair to stand here and make it look as if the 0.75 would always be higher than 1%. Oh, yes. It is very unfair because you have had opportunity to go behind and find out who gets what within the 1%. But you didn't take your time to come and ask Ministry of Trade, who gets what in the 0.75? So how do you compare apples with oranges? It's not too fa fair. You see, when you do this, then the senior journalists like Obi Menu them will come and ask questions as to in whose interest are you operating. There's no doubt in my mind that when you come to the port today, 
everybody working in the port has some kind of emotional attachment either to GCNet or West Blue. There's no doubt about that. The reason being that prior to our coming into power, there was serious theft war between these two companies. In fact, one of the reasons why we had to go and settle on one company to come and do this job was the fact that these two companies were not talking. These two agencies were not communicating. The reason being that the uh, SLA license for GCNet is a bit higher than that of West Blue. And the IT world, if you don't have your licenses on the same platform, on the same level, there's no way you can integrate. When you do that, other agencies outside will not respect the higher grade that has joined the smaller grade because it's always very, very uh, uh, tricky. So that was GC Nestans in not allowing West Blue to integrate with them unless they acquire that certification before they will be able to uh, lace with them. In the meanwhile, the smaller one, the one with the smaller certification, was trying to swallow the one with the bigger certification. Being the one that is going to do the tunnel from here to Makola, so that the bigger ones will rather join and help them to dig the tunnel. So it was always a conflict. And I can tell you, and I can stand here and tell you without blinking an eye, that because of yeah. these shortfalls, people were even clearing brand new Range Rovers from the port at 5,000 Ghana cities. 5,000 Ghana cities. And if you say, uh, if you don't believe me, go to customs and find out. People were clearing whole containers of fruit juice for 11,000 Ghana cities because two systems were not talking. That is how bad we're losing revenue in this country. So if a government comes into power and we think that we are over-reliant on import revenue, so we have to find a way to maximize revenue collection. And one of the things we have to do is to ensure that we get these two together. And if getting them together is becoming a problem, and we have identified that even not us, before we came into government, the previous government has invited the Korea government to bring their customs unipass and show us how it's done. And just on the verge of signing the contract, it, it swerved to uh, another company called West Rule. So these guys have to leave the country after taking custom, with senior customs officers to Korea to train them and all that. We are doing Ghana a very good service by not even going to America or London to bring a different person. The same people that the NDC government brought in in 2015. We said, come back. Because we have seen what you have provided, and we think it's the best that can help us. And this time, we are not just even going to look at just customs uh, revenue or customs uh, uh, import uh, revenue. We are going to look at income tax. We are going to look at point of sale devices. We are going to look at so many things within Unipass. Unipass does so many things more than what we have today. So let us understand that uh, as an MPP government, which is in power today, it is not in our interest to kill people's businesses. I have an emotional attachment to GCNet because I'm a pioneer of GCNet. I was around the first day GCNet was rolled out in the port, and we made GCNet survive. I have a serious attachment to people within GCNet. Put me aside. Pick my minister. My minister has a brother-in-law in, in GCNet. In fact, this brother-in-law is the one that had the wife dying at the a trade fair uh, 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 fire that broke out some time back. So you think that my minister will be wicked, so wicked, to take food from his in-law for his nieces and, 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 and nephews to go hungry? We are not that wicked. We don't have any reason to, as it were, peg any company. But you will see in the presentation, the mention of Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Trade. Let me correct something here. The Ministry of Trade has no right. We have, in fact, no grounds to come out and sign any contract, which is not a contract from government. We are government. The government agency responsible for trade facilitation. We have people seated in Geneva. We have people seated in Brussels, permanent representatives. We call them experts, negotiating trade facilitation agreement and arrangements. So therefore, if it comes to trade facilitation, it is we, the Ministry of Trade, that goes in there to sign, like my gentleman said, the Vice President's Office will not sign a contract, the President's Office will not sign a contract, the Chief of Staff's Office does not sign a contract. It will always be 
the government ministry which is in charge. That is why you see the Ministry of Trade signing the contract with Unipass. It does not mean, therefore, that it's the Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Trade. It is a government signed contract. MPP government signed contract. So leave the Ministry of Trade thing out so that we don't try and create a certain situation where people would have to, uh, or to be seen as if you want to hit people's head together. That must be assumed. And in concluding, i like to touch on the uh, governance structure that was displayed. It is the best, or would have been the best, but for one simple reason. When you allow private people the opportunity to get closer to the seat of government, they now tend to either look down upon or neglect the government agencies that are responsible for the particular exercise. And that is what I have seen here. If we allow, let's say, uh, people to bypass the Ministry of Trade and go straight to the president and speak to the president, you think they will have respect for the Ministry of Trade anymore? Anything happens, they want to run to the ministry, they want to run to the president. And that is what I see on this board. Because if you really understand the concept of trade facilitation, you should know that the governance structure you see there, it is only being put together for the presidency to head, but every advice or every information that the, gov the presidency would operate upon would have to come from the Ministry of Trade. No two ways about it. And I have proposed this long before now, long before governments before now, that we need to have a National Trade Facilitation and Development Co Council, which will be headed by the presidency whereby all the very interministerial uh, interventions that we need in the port, we put them together so that we can move on uh, as a country. But if it happens the way my uh, president of Ghana and Free for is putting it, it becomes problematic because one will feel that once I have the vice presidents, who are you in the ministry? And it always becomes a challenge that people have to deal with. I am begging us, let us not see what has been presented as something which is totally flawed, no. Like I said, I associate myself with so many of the things that he has put to the fore. But in getting to the end, I realized that that is not actually what they wanted to put up. But what they want, actually wanted to talk about was Unipass at the end. That is how I feel, though. It could be wrong, but that is how I feel. And I am fortunate to be here as a member of Ghana Institute of Free for this to be able to also uh, bring out my mind on some of the issues that have been sponged. I think that I still invite them, this time not to me, Maybe because I have shown my intentions here, so you all know. I would invite them to come and meet my minister, who is the Minister for Trade, Mr. Alan Shumatin, for him to brief them on the, or answer the questions that they have put to the fore. That day, if it is okay, maybe we'll invite you to also come around. So you listen for the first time that GIF is going to ask questions about Unipass for us to tell you why Unipass is this. Or why he passes that. I thank you and I say God bless you. Uh, Minister, before you say that, let me ask a question because you have touched on so many things. One, if indeed the government of Ghana is going to go with the what happens to GCNet and West? Would they still have a contract running? Would it mean that we are going to terminate the contract? If, of course, we are going to terminate, then we are thinking of dead men there. No. That is one. No. <laughs> that is one. Two. Okay. The government also says that. Maybe in a forum. The government also says that implementing Unipass will mean that the government of Ghana will take total control of both of the security and revenue management at the borders, as well as monitor the administrative performance of its employees. Probably you have to explain to us what this means. Who said that one? That's what is, is in the statement in respect of signing the agreement with. The first one, let us note that any contract without termination or um, um, Expiry uh, uh, articles, it's not a contract at all. Every contract in this world, if it is valid, must have termination clause and an expiry clause. As far as you are concerned, we can tell you without having any problems, any challenges, that the contracts of GCNet will be seen through and the contracts of um, West Blue will certainly uh, be seen through. The only challenge here, I believe, is that um, West Blue, when we were transferring from destination inspection to, uh, sorry, from the destination inspection companies to a customs uh, platform for valuation, we moved the authority or the control 
from Ministry of Trade and took it to Ministry of Finance. So the arrangement or the agreement between government of Ghana and West Blue is signed by the Ministry of Finance. But as I speak to you today, I can tell you for a fact that that agreement is in the process of expiring. It is not in our interest to abrogate it. If we have to abrogate it, we will use the necessary uh, uh, lines, channels, to abrogate it. After all, our contracts have been abrogated here before in Ghana. If you don't use the proper means, they will go and take judgment there. But we'll use the proper means to abrogate it. And don't forget that it's not when you run first to the courts that you are judged the victor. So we are very poised in our res res resolve to ensure that no such co uh, the judgment that befalls Ghana. We would see to it that the trans um, fair, the transfer from these um, existing platforms to the new Unipass will be done and done smoothly for the betterment of Ghana. No two ways about that. Now, what I also want to mention is that this Unipass thing, as far as my memory could serve me, in 2015, when they come, came in, was a government-to-government -government contract. And listen to it very carefully. Unlike GCNet, which has about 60% or more to foreign interest, this particular one is a government-to-government -government contract. The only difference here is when those Koreans came in. They needed a platform to op operate on. Because you cannot just enter and start using anything at all like that. They needed a platform to operate on. And then in 2015, Ghana Link was the one, I don't know whether it was giving out on um, uh, bid and whatever process, what do you call that thing? W whether it was tendered for people to bid. But somehow, in the records that we met in, 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 in government, we realized that Ghana Link was the company that won the contract to provide a platform for Unipass to do their, to roll out their, um, to, to roll out their, 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 their program. And they were with them throughout, all through and through, until the contract or the project fell through and the Koreans had to go back. So therefore, we, I am repeating here that this contract that has been signed, as you have read from the paragraphs, in the, in the contract, is going to be a government to government team with a private uh, 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 institution, private agency, serving uh, the platform for operation. Now, if this were so, then it stands to reason that when it comes to security and whatever, it's a government thing and nobody else comes in. But this time, it is owned by government and not by a private group. Government of Ghana, I think we should take the questions as, because yeah. they either win, they either then. He came to ask a question, they turned into a speech. Then it's going to hijack this. Ministry of Trade is the government agency responsible for trade facilitation projects or trade facilitation rollouts. And anything to do with trade net and trade net uh, platforms, it's the baby of the Ministry of Trade. Um, like I said earlier, GCNet contract is signed by the Ministry of Trade. West Blue, what, like that's what I was explaining. All the all the destination inspections, the Ghana Link, the Bivac, and all those people, they signed their contract with the Ministry of Trade. But when it was moving to the customs platform for valuation, the Ministry of Finance took over. As to how it happened then for this non-alignment to come in, I cannot tell. The government of the day decided to give that opportunity to Minister of Finance, which I or we in the government today feel it is wrong, because if the Ministry of Trade is the one that is having permanent staff sitting at Brussels negotiating trade facilitation issues, and you want another agency to go and sign, what about if they sign something which is not appropriate in the annals of trade facilitation? So the, 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 the issue is that what we came to meet is West Blue has a contract which is signed by Minister of Finance. Well, we are in government. We say Ministry of Finance, if Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Trade then were not compatible. Today, Ministry of Trade and Ministry of Finance, we are very compatible. So it doesn't matter who signs. Anything that comes, I can tell you also for a fact, anything that comes up, the Ministry of Finance will refer to us and we will be the ones to handle. So therefore, uh, and it's even interesting that Ministry of Finance has signed their contract, 
But when it comes to the National Trade Facilitation uh, Committee and all those things, it's the Ministry of Trade that chairs. So for me, it, it was a very funny situation to be created then, but it doesn't spoil anything. Right now, we are trying to realign all these things. In fact, I had a, a discussion with the... We made our intention so clear. This document is doing the rounds. We have Unipass right there. In fact, the whole document and its content is doing the round. Where we launch into Unipass, it's part of the document. So, my good brother, we have not hidden our intentions at all. And this is also not a performance. We are engineering a conversation. I like the bit of it when you mentioned that a, a platform. I mean, you, you, you know very well that this is not a platform that we can do this. He talks, we talk. This, we have called you here to let you know of alternate views. We have demonstrably shown you that what is a myth is a governance structure. And I disagree with the fact that the national trade facilitation structure must not be biased toward private sector. In fact, the trade facilitation agreement, the World Trade Organization, every discussion in itself has the private sector in there. In fact, the trade facilitation committee must be co-chaired by a private sector. So that is why in my conversation I said that it will be useful for us to get the intent of the global discussion so that when we are arranging the local situations, we do not lose the balance. It is very, very important. The, the global narrative must be impressed on the local situation. Otherwise, we will have totally different things happening on the ground. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to let you know that we stand by every bit of information we have shared with you this morning. If I am permitted to, can we say thank you very much? Sorry I didn't acknowledge you and all of that from the beginning. We are so happy you were able to make this time for us. We are available anytime. Our phone lines are going to be shared. Let's uh, talk some more. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Thanks for coming.